Well, hello again. I'm Bob Morgan, a companion of Set and Knight of Shambhala. And this is the Egyptian Magic Podcast. So for this episode, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Alistair Crowley, which I know I probably talk about quite a lot in, in passing. Uh, uh, in he crops up in various things to do with Egyptian magic, which is an issue in itself. But um, this lunar month coming is uh, dedicated to the Egyptian god. Horus, which uh, will be the subject of its own podcast uh, in due course in a couple of weeks' time. But it, it also is a kind of quite a happy coincidence that uh, it's also, I suppose you say, Crowley Mass Day, if you want to be sort of slightly tongue-in-cheek about it, that it's, it's widely celebrated as a... a amongst the, I suppose, the small but dedicated group of people across the world who are into the Alistair Crowley philosophy in one way or another, which was has was received in Egypt at about this time, basically on the 8th, 9th and 10th of April, in fact. And there's an interesting story connected with that. So... As I speak, and probably as I put this out, it will kind of coincide with um, the the reception, uh, festival of the reception of this sacred text that uh, Crowley channeled in, in Cairo or in the vicinity of the pyramids as well, um, more than 100 years ago now, I think, 1904. So just over 100 years ago. And, you know, there are all sorts of interesting things with that. I suppose one of the things that often comes up is, is to what extent is Crowley's philosophy uh, dependent upon or a, a version of the Egyptian magical religion? Uh, and that, that's what some people will say it's it, apart from the kind of exotic elements placed in there it has very little relationship with egyptian religion but i don't think that is that quite holds up i think it's legitimate to think of it as a kind of revived version of uh, egyptian way anyway perhaps i'll argue a little bit more and give some examples of why they i think that's true let's say for me the story of alistair crowley's moment of truth in cairo in 1904 is one of the most interesting in a lifetime graced by perhaps half a dozen such peak experiences for crowley 1904 was a pivotal year in crowley's career he was uh, 29 years old and therefore well known or well into what is known as uh, the saturn return uh, which is the time in, in astro astronomy or astrology to, when Saturn returns to the position that it, it occupied at, at the time of your birth, at about 27 to 31 years old in that period. And it's called the Saturn return. And often it's a moment of crisis or reflection or it, it usually marks a, a milestone in your life. Usually when people talk about it, they talk about people who, only live 27 years, only live to their first Saturn return. People like Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and Kurt Cobain as, uh, uh, as being celebrities who are famously, uh, and there's a whole list of them, in fact, so many that people think it can't be a coincidence. So it's obviously a, I suppose, of uh, 27, it, it, whatever, even without the astronomy and uh, the Saturnine connection, it would be a, 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 
a moment uh, of passage from one life to another. You might have finished most of your education. Uh, you might have started on your career, or if you haven't, you, you, you'd be worrying about that and, and thinking that you really ought to sort out. I know someone said to me, <laughs> that, you know, it's time. You really need to make a decision about what you're going to be doing with the rest of your life. Uh, perhaps that's not fair, but it's the sort of thing that people do expect of you at about that time. So, it, knowing what we do about Alistair Crowley, uh, it's a strange fact that he'd more or less given up on uh, the magic of his youth, uh, as it was. He'd kind of given it a good go and everything. Uh, and it, he's had various experiences, but he more or less decided that it, it wasn't for him. So, yeah, he was in his Saturn return. That's a typical example of someone who has kind of let go of uh, their previous uh, ideas and was looking for something new. He'd actually um, just got married. He was having a, a good time uh, on an inheritance, a very large inheritance which enabled him to make all sorts of right and wrong choices to travel and to uh, experience life but even with all that i think you can surmise that he was quite disillusioned uh with with what were the choices he'd made up until that point he was had become a, a member of the victorian a cult society well known in the literature as the uh, Golden Dawn, a hermetic order of the Golden Dawn. And he joined that thinking it was the answer, but it, in the end it had not been the answer. It just led to more trouble and he'd been rejected from it. And like any hierarchical organization and internal rivalries, blow things apart and that's what happened it blew things apart in all sorts of internal conflicts in litigation and law courts and acrimony and arguments in the street uh and including a deadly uh magical battle so called between the autocratic autocratic master of the order as, as then was Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers, uh, who many say had been kind of overwhelmed by megalomania of one sort, or just magical madness. Because it's difficult to think of megalomania, given that you're talking about an obs obscure occult fraternity or sodality, to give it its name. And he was locked in a conflict with his former friends who wanted his job, wanted the ring, as they say sometimes in magic, wanted to be the, the master. Uh, these are the pitfalls of magical organizations in our time, I suppose, the wannabe masters and mistresses who wanted to take his crown for him. And Crowley was still... A relatively young upstart had taken his chances and sided with the boss, with McGregor Mathers. Uh, and he was in the middle of a kind of magical retreat in Scotland at Beleskin, which is a kind of, um, I, I suppose, a quite a nice house. I've never been there, but it looks quite nice from the photographs on the shores of Loch Ness that he'd kind of bought with his money and put it aside as a kind of uh, retreat center. It should be said that uh, this place is still in existence. And uh, as we speak, I think, I think I'm right in saying that a group of followers or more than that members uh, uh, have managed to take over ownership of this uh, this place and have renovated it. It was actually, they uh, almost as soon as they took it over and got planning permission and all the rest, uh, it was firebombed <laughs> or, or arsonized or whatever you call it. Nobody knows by who. Obsessive types, perhaps 
local religious rivals nobody's quite sure luckily it was insured i think that's right in saying and they virtually had to rebuild the thing from from the foundations up and one day it will open to the public as or as some sort of guest house and retreat center and center uh, in that part of the world for people who are interested and i'm sure they do very well i, I mentioned that as well because in uh, about six months time uh, we're having a uh, a conference here in oxford uh, a revival of a, a ground breaking series that we did in uh, many years ago called uh, Symposium of Thelemic Magic, Symposium being a reference to the sort of classical idea of how you explore things, the sort of pleasure, mixing pleasure and knowledge giving. So there's a, a, an all day conference or, and most of the evening social event with uh, great speakers from all over the place. And we're hoping that the Two people who are involved with the renovation of Boleskine will also make an appearance and tell us a little bit about the renovations and uh, how that's been going and the background to it and other aspects of uh, Crowley's magic. So that's quite an interesting aside that uh, do please look in the uh, show notes or for this podcast uh, and uh, there should be a link to the website if you want to know who else is speaking. Quite a star-studded uh, variety of people, and uh, do come along. It uh, it's going it's a great way, rather than just books and online things, to actually meet people in the flesh uh, who are interested in these sort of things. It's often quite a, a breakthrough moment uh, and quite important way that the magic group community perpetuates itself so uh, that, that's an aside but I'll, I'll put some more information at the end as well so Crowley as I said was in this uh, Scottish retreat house engaged in a magical operation known as the Abramelin operation which is one of these magical uh, rituals that people in a, in the Thelemic tradition and the occult tradition tradition find quite uh, significant and an important milepost in their magical careers and they have to put aside quite a lot of time to try and make this magical breakthrough. Variously either six months or sometimes some accounts is 18 months. Uh, so he was uh, engaged, but probably bought the house in order to do this. It was certainly useful for it because he had complete control and it's very isolated. So he's right in the middle of this practice. Uh, and then magical war broke out within the Golden Dawn order that he was part of. So he had to sort of stop what he was doing. We didn't have to, but he kind of felt it was a, a moment to do it. You might speculate he probably was maybe he's fed up with it i don't know anyway he headed down to london to do his bit in defense of the head of the magical order it's all a bit pompous really but once you've broken off from that particular magical work <clears throat> you can't just go back and restart it it's one of these things that is time critical uh it has to be started <coughs> It has to be started on a particular astrological moment, which, uh, as it happens, coincides more or less with where we are now in, in, in April. It would have coincided with uh, Easter or the Passover or the Equinox, all these sort of things. Uh, so he, he would have to wait for another year before he could start again is as as it were for some reason that's the rule apparently of this ritual so he he kind of um engaged in this magical battle which didn't go very well and it 
he kind of more or less left the organization and just headed off to do a bit of traveling and all sorts of things happened to him i don't think he ever he didn't certainly didn't come back to it the next year in the version that he was following of this abramelin thing it began on the jewish passover and continued for six months um and gathering from a more recent and completely uh complete published version of of the ritual we now know it should actually be 18 months but in the 15th century this person called abraham began his retreat at easter or jewish passover uh, which itself is a very important ancient feast connected with demons and angels of death and all this sort of stuff. So it's, it kind of fits together. Uh, these myths make use of a doorway of one kind or another, and the ancient Hebrew supposedly inscribed magical signs over the lintels of the doorway as a signal to the angel of death to pass over the people in the house. I've connected it elsewhere with uh, the feast. And it's also known as with the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. This is an Egyptian feast. Uh, the modern interpretations tells us this is originally a reminder of the temporary dwellings used by the early Hebrews during their flight from Egypt. Um, but there's probably more to it than that, really. This idea of these temporary shrines or booths or tents, if you like, uh, that plays a quite a significant part in uh, Egyptian uh, kind of uh, religion as as well. But that's uh, another story. But it, so it it could well be that even that idea of the temporary shrine is something with a resonance from from egypt so that is a sort of already seeing some connections with egypt uh as i say crowley's kind of gambit or whatever you call it with the golden dawn didn't go very well and he was expelled and or left under a, a cloud and there are various versions of what happened as for the Book of Abramelin, as I say, the magical moment has passed and there was no point in his. So Crowley traveled to Mexico and as so often happened in his life, uh, he didn't return for several years, so not the next year. And when he did go back to Scotland, he was not so interested if you like he's more interested in mundane things you'd say or just having a good time and one thing led to another and he met his future wife rose kelly um again you know a typical crowley never does things in that easy way does he he ended up eloping with her uh because the family didn't really approve of them of of it and they eloped and got married uh she came from quite a well-to-do family as did he uh, really but maybe in the way these things were then we thought his family was not quite as was in trade as it were and they were more uh of a patrician background the way these odd divisions of work out uh although so he knew the family they were the families were known to each other but they didn't really want him as a as an in-law uh so to escape the bad vibes coming from this f new family they set out together on a world tour which would be their honeymoon uh and they got on a ship as one did then there were no airplanes or anything and they arrived in alexandria which is not very far from cairo and uh you know would be relatively easy to get to cairo from alexandria where they plan to do some sightseeing in the fascinating city and obviously the archaeological sites plus the nightlife and crowley already knew the city this is the weird thing he had been there several times before uh so whatever what was about to happen is it's disputed whether he'd sort of set this whole thing up maybe i suppose you have to think about 
this is a, a Crowley in all of his travels and like was always setting up these little uh things you know that if he ever returned he could it's like he buried treasure or something uh so that if he returned he could it'd be this impressive thing of saying well look what i found which may sound unlike but it it, it is a feature of the magical world this um i suppose call it surrealism if you like the planting of magical objects in order that they be found again you know it's controversial even to say that that sometimes happens it, i don't think it invalidates anything but uh, it certainly is a feature and there's an idea that if you can fake it until you make it almost that if you and this is, might be the same in the, in the magical orders if the people who make the things or found these things often know that they're kind of making it up it's a sort of fiction or give it a portion of platonic lie but the people who come along afterwards don't necessarily know that that it is kind of uh, that someone has manipulated the situation and and it does deliver to them then a, a magical experience i mean th there's so many examples of this now it um, i think you just have to accept it that it's part is, is a technique of magic in its way it's like with a crop circle business that uh, i i know for a fact that people who when out when that was a thing made these rather beautiful pieces of land art called crop circles well of course they knew that um they'd made they made them right and then leave them and they're, they're anonymous things and then uh, other people come along and they start having visions in these things how do you explain that? I say, oh, well, uh, people are very susceptible, but then other people come along with metal detectors and all the rest, and right in the center of these crop circles, they find artifacts. So that that's weird, isn't it? I think so. So we just anyway. So Crowley, in the context of Crowley, there's uh, there's a, quite an elaborate series of books now by. I should say Richard Cole, who is a very, very he's very obsessed with Salima, but he's very critical of Crowley's game-playing uh, elements, and feels that he's exposed the fact that this whole incident that happened in Cairo had been set up by Crowley and researched by Crowley years before. Plus, most of the text had been written by him in other ways, and he was just looking for a suitable moment to sort of to trigger it, you know, to trigger this sort of uh, whole scene. That's a very cynical way of looking at it, but it's, it's not impossible, I, I would guess. Um, anyway, that's that's one idea, and also Crowley knowing the city, which is an enormous city knew how to get around and paid uh money uh to the local family at the time and probably still there right has some sort of ownership or, or stewardship of the pyramid area and if you've got the right uh contacts and money you can today even uh, certainly back then you get special access and he was able to get special access uh and he wanted to take his uh, new wife into the pyramids, a bit of kind of hocus pocus, uh, and impress her with, you know, which is, there's a weird contradiction there from the fact that I also said that he was disillusioned with all this stuff, but at the same time, it was part of him and he wanted to use it as an, to impress. Uh, apparently he had a copy you see you never know how many of these details are true or not and how many of the kind of legend uh or the setup you know the the, the setup thing as i say there are all these books 
<laughs> that expose all these things and some of the exposure is seems to work more than others uh it it's difficult i haven't looked at it but but sometimes they, they have a point uh so he he's got a copy of a book called quite well known book called the goisha which is an old uh grimoire in which you uh, invoke um one or other of these 72 demons are uh, from this tradition which one way or another this sort of set of demons uh or spirits can be traced back to uh ancient egypt in fact some somewhere in the book it actually says that they speak the egyptian language which is fairly clear and some of them seem to have names that are look egyptian but I, I don't think crowley made too too much maybe he didn't know that but it is an interesting thing that the goetia has this egyptian connection crowley's version adds a little bit to it he had some well he he adds this little ritual that had been doing the rounds in the magic community of the time for a number of decades in fact uh which he called the preliminary invocation but had been translated by some earlier scholar masonic scholar perhaps and it's definitely another one of these um, egyptian rituals from a whole collection it was the one of the first that this collection that people often talk about the the pgm the papyri magicae greek guy which uh essentially egyptian grimoires uh but some of them some of them written partly in greek and other languages that had been discovered in egypt about at this time or not much before for the time of crowley uh and various bits of it was steadily being translated the i think the first bit that was translated from the the, the pgm the magical papyri from egypt was the so-called mithras liturgy which again is a long magical book a grimoire dedicated to the god of mithras which uh very very interesting in its own right and one uh, perhaps the first or uh, around about the same time was this small exorcism text maybe you'd say or ritual text uh which in the the book itself is is known as the, the book of uh, jew the painter of hieroglyphs so it's ascribed to a, a character who wrote several other books uh in on magic and on coptic magic a coptic figure uh who is supposedly someone who painted hieroglyphs painted the kind of scenes within the egyptian tombs uh wh whether what this person really existed or not or it certainly probably existed as a famous magician in the classical world um and whoever put together this little ritual the preliminary invocation ascribed it to this this character so that's that's very definite egyptian connection uh in the origin story of uh crowley's magic one way or another is but you know also for the magic community in in general as we discussed many times that the, the nature of this ritual it invokes a kind of hybrid deity uh who is part osiris but also has certain sides to it that look like the god said uh especially especially there's it's almost like two sides of the same god i think that's one way of looking at it. Uh, that's disputed and much discussed and perhaps something we'll come back to at another time but i think it's fair to say there's certainly setian elements within that uh ritual if only for the fact that old cyrus figures in it and he's getting he's referred to as headless and how does he end up in this headless state if not from the intervention of his demonic initiator set so whatever way you look at it this little preliminary ritual and 
Goetia, I'd argue, and the location within the uh, pyramids themselves places the entire uh, Thelemic cult, Crowley cult, well within the Egyptian tradition, I would so I, I can see, I know people uh, argue about this one way or another, say, well, apart from that, his other motive is has been written, I think, uh, is any magician, all the magicians want to have an Egyptian connection. They want to have gone to Egypt and they want the spirits to have spoken to them. It's a kind of, um, it, it's a qualification, if you like, for being uh, a, a real magician is to have been to Egypt and have understood the mysteries. You have to do it at least once in your life. Uh, something that fits with that idea is, of, is the fact that Crowley has this big at peak moment, this big experience in the in the pyramids, and I, I think somewhere I read that there's obviously an idea that he really ought to go back and uh, meet the spirits again, and also to go to Upper Egypt, but he never did. Apparently, he got what he wanted. He got the kind of the badge, if you like. Uh, anyway, the results of the ritual, all this, you know, given the location, it was fairly impressive for uh, Rose Kelly. And later, back in what was probably a very lavish hotel room, no doubt having have a little bit of the local vintage wine, the Omar Khayyam. Fittingly, old that is one of the best. Uh, she apparently fell into a light trance and said, well, look, they're waiting for you now. Uh, as I say, I'm going to paraphrase this, but uh, there are much more accurate accounts available if you really want the whole story. Uh, and as I say, some say Crowley had prepared all this years before. Uh, it was a bit too good to be true. But he did have the right magical books to ha hand. Uh, and the key, perhaps, is that it was Passover in Cairo. Uh, we know that from looking at the calendar of the time. Therefore, it was a full moon. And exactly the right time to start another Egyptian uh, ritual, if, if we could say that, or certainly for the Abramelin, which he let off, left off years before. Uh, according to the uh, medieval account, this is the time to start it. And a, because he, he left it on hold and now was the right time to start it. In the account of Abramelin, it does say that the adepts taught this ritual were from Upper Egypt, which probably never went to. You think he didn't want to go there. Uh, and Abramelin eventually, like, this is the myth of the magician, had tried all over Europe to get knowledge of magic and in the end was told to go to Egypt this is in the Middle Ages, apparently, according to the story, where he did actually meet people who were able to teach him. So Crowley, who was already experienced in the Abermelin system, seems to have used it to put himself in touch with his guardian demon, Demona, his uh, guardian spirit, who comes with a name, Iwas, uh, which some people say is I was, <laughs> uh, by kind of wordplay. Well, again, if you do wordplay, see, wordplay, even if we say Iwas is I was, this is a very Egyptian technique, the wordplay. I'm not saying Crowley would know all this, but say looking at it, it is interesting that these things just seem to happen naturally. It was an entity which some say was his own psyche speaking to him. There's a famous photograph of Crowley with his magical book, uh, with the one with a pentagram on the cover. And that book is is related to Abermelin. It's the collection of magical squares. Uh that you need to prepare to charge up during if the Abramelin ritual is successful. Uh, and of course, magical squares themselves is another technique uh, that is could be and is traced back to uh, ancient Egypt and one of the most famous 
of magical squares, the Sator uh, Repo square or sequence uh, has a, an Egyptian translation of it and seems to be related to Egyptian law. So you see the things are stacking up, are they really? Uh, I mentioned that I was, it lends itself to this wordplay I was, uh, and it seems to have a split personality dictating a book uh, which seems contradictory. This is so that over three days, they get a chapter a day, you know, uh, maybe I'll read a little bit of it or add a little bit of a reading at, <coughs> at the end. One chapter a day to an hour's dictation from the spirit, whether this is the spirit dictating or whether it is, again, Rose Kelly in a trance dictating. All of these things have been suggested. I say a split personality because you, you've got sort of two major themes. You've got almost the law of the jungle, you know, and then you've got the sort of Another piece of word tray, uh, word play. You've got altruism, <laughs> the altruistic or Martian connection within the Book of the Law. The two sides come from the same thing. Uh, the late Snow Wilson took up the story years later when Crowley uh, has sort of come to terms with what had happened to him in Cairo tries to found an alternative community based on these uh, principles dedicated, uh, dictated to him by the Egyptian spirits he met in Cairo or, or were channeled for him in Cairo by his wife. It was a brave attempt in the time to found uh, an alternative lifestyle to see if it could work. Uh, but again, for various reasons, it kind of fell apart. It didn't quite work. But commun alternative communities are often short-lived and quite difficult to uh, actually manage. Uh, and, you know, sometimes things can go wrong in terms of abuse. So, but in the end, they were at spell from Sicily, uh, not because of anything particularly they'd done even though there was loads of drama and people were ill and someone died connected with oxford in fact it's more that they got the wrong side of the politics of the time uh, especially the connection probably with freemasonry which although in britain we associate freemasonry with the establishment elite one way or another. In Europe, it's slightly different. Uh, secret societies often have an association with radical politics, especially of the left. Um, perhaps these sort of factors meant that the new government of uh, Mussolini, which was very right-leaning, of course, fascist, thought, we can't have this. They've got to go. These foreigners have got to leave, and uh, they issued an order for them to be a spell from Italy, which apparently was quite to the um, regret of the Sicilian people, who, despite the fact they were probably quite conventional, although there are some crazy things on the island, apparently, they had come to sort of enjoy the presence of what they called the Purple Priest and his followers. The, it, it brought other people in, and they, they didn't seem to mind, but uh, they had no choice. So, as I say, you've got this channel document, which you can read for yourself. It's full of Egyptian gods and goddesses. Not the usual suspects either, especially when you're talking about the goddess Newt that I've talked about a few times. It's Of all the goddesses to hit upon, that is... A, a mark of genius, really, to bring new it uh, to the fore in your magical system, because that is the, the right on the money, and that is part of the primary corpus of uh, Egyptian magic, although not everybody knows that, of course, uh, not yet. 
as I say, there's some dispute amongst the uh, aficionados about Crowley and Egypt, as those who, such as myself, think his system is a fair version uh, of, of an Egyptianized system, and, and in a way, the Egyptians themselves, who had no official view, uh, would probably have recognized it as being part of theirs uh, and been okay with it. Uh, and then there are others around that I've heard say, oh, it's, they've used this ugly term, Egyptoid, um, meaning a little bit phony. I suppose it's like people call, say they've got Hellenism, they've got this term Hellenism for Egyptian, uh, for Greek culture, and Hellenistic, or a sort of derived version of the high, supposedly highfalutin Greek culture, that was comes at the end of it, but a lot of people don't accept that idea anymore. Really, it's, you see things as developments, uh, one from the other. So there's good things about the Hellenic culture, but there are also very good things, perhaps even better things, about the Hellenistic culture. Often, the Hellenistic or the so-called Egyptoid is the uh, can be better can be more more on the money but what as i say whatever way you look at it egyptian religion runs very deep within the work of alistair crowley and especially this uh channeled text his book of the law is a good place to start although it can, all right it's good good job it's short because it's very very dense text like a kind of tantric text takes a a lot of uh, disentangling and uh, there's a lot of obscurities in it in strange language uh, as i say it was received in uh, in in cairo uh, although perhaps it was outlined in some way earlier uh, and crowley was sort of putting it all together in this sort of psychic way it's devoted to uh three egyptian gods although i probably should explain that there's knew it the star goddess who uh, most people don't have a problem with there is the second chapter is dedicated by the look of it to a god called had it uh and like i say the joke had it has had it but had it is uh almost certainly a misreading of of the of the egyptian term bahadit meaning the horus of edfu the winged sun edfu being the center of the of the cult of of horus but all the way through from then on through the text and in the third book had it is referred to as if they are a unknown god <clears throat> or a new god that's made themselves known through this text which might have appealed to crowley but he i don't know he must have realized this but w whatever i i think in a way it misdirects people because people try and work out who had it might be <clears throat> and often they end up looking outside of egypt to mesopotamia for gods that have a similar name uh, because you can't really find one in Egypt. But as I say, it's a false problem. Uh, because had it is Horus, is, is bad. It is the Horus of Edfu. Uh, and with that in place, it, it all makes sense. Uh, I suppose there is, just to make things confusing, whatever, if you look at the early versions, which perhaps might have been accessible to crowley the the plans of uh of ed food uh the rooms had been named at that stage they can given names that they don't have anymore and one of them was the hood it or that perhaps the had it so there was a room at ed food called the had it which apparently, I don't know if that's an Arabic term or, or, or what, but apparently it means uh, the room of the magician. Certainly the guys would have said that, and it's there on the early plans. 
Uh, I'll see if I can find a picture of that to prove it. Um, I think the same room these days would be uh, renamed or it, it's still not the original name, would have been given the name the uh, laboratory. So it would be the room that was uh, decorated with all sorts of scenes of uh, chemical uh, experiments or in fact the preparation and the recipes for the for the creation of the incenses and perfumes that were used for uh in the temple you know the various incenses and, and perfumes and uh, what's it and there are quite a lot of them and all of the these formula are on the wall of, of one particular room there are other ones as well but they're concentrated in one area and that room therefore gets the name laboratory and you know, it's only on the walls whether they actually did the uh, uh, the the composition of these things in that room is another matter but the formulas are there so that's an interesting thing it is a possibility that crowley had somehow well he never went there but he may have seen diagrams of the place but that's the nearest you can get to the word had it that i know and i think essentially the second book of that he channeled is, is devoted to the god Horus. So the third book, I suppose the thing that people find the most awkward about that is that that would mean that the third book would be dedicated to also to Horus, so you don't know it, and two, two books dedicated to Horus, which might seem a bit lacking in symmetry, but it actually from an egyptian perspective it can make sense because the because horus has several different forms but he does have these two major uh forms the relationship between them being quite mysterious and it, and mysterious in the sense of interesting to try and disentangle okay you have horus as the son of Osiris and Isis in one story, which is an important tradition and the whole argument with Set and all the rest and, you know, conception after the death of Osiris in this whole mystery tradition. And you have another Horus who is the son of uh, Geb and Nuit. So in in both cases it, well in certainly in one case you have knew it as the, as the mother and so you have to have her son which is horus so you've got two forms of horus uh within the tradition and they're both incredibly important and they both have a very long tradition so one way or another the fact of having two horuses is it it can work maybe that's what rather than all the other kind of convoluted ways of making sense of that 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 seems to be a more interesting mystery so this other the, we might call one of them horus the elder you've got horus the child and you've got horus the elder if you like the adult the very old god horus from the ptolemaic greeks also known as, as i say horus the elder who is a form of horus as i say who was the son of geb and knew it and he's one of the oldest gods of Egypt, uh, who is, you know, known about from the very earliest pre-dynastic settlements. So he's also called the son of truth or Mart, uh, and he's got a role as the upholder of Mart. Also, this Horus is the the right eye of the sun was the left eye was the moon he's sometimes depicted as a falcon as well and he's got another interesting name which is a great black one and i say there's all sorts of mysteries woven uh woven around this uh horus the elder including a connection as a sort of vampire god but that's uh, again another thing uh, so it could be that the older Horus is the one that's uh, depicted in the third chapter of the Book of the Law. I would say there's an overlap between both books and the uh, mythology of, of Horus, but certainly the middle one is more about, uh, I think I'm right in saying, the kind of Horus, the, the child, and the third one is, is maybe Horus the elder. Um, 
as I say, when I talk about the the spelling mistake of mistaking had it for bahad it, uh, it does tell you a little bit about the limits of uh, Crowley's Egyptology uh, because of the obvious misspelling. Uh, apparently he did take the steli to or went to the museum and asked them to, uh, about more about it to the assisting curator of the time who was uh he had a very illustrious name but, but really it was his brother apparently who was the main man so he would be say we say part of the second team <laughs> And so the, the, the book was translated again. So the first translation, not very good. And perhaps never thought to to point this out, that the steli has this name on it. It doesn't say had it on the steli. It just doesn't. So you have to know something about the language to be able to work that out, the name uh, of, of that form of Hor Horus, uh, the bad it is there on the steli. So, I think that's it. The, the interesting sort of uh, connection with the Book of the Law, uh, mythology, and uh, the the kind of things that they do uh, are there. The third. Some people say the third chapter is is the uh, one they find the most difficult, but it does have all sorts of very interesting things in it. It has some things that we that Crowley didn't like, and we're not going to like very much. Uh, in terms of his attitude to other religions, which actually is very un-Egyptian, I, I, I would guess, being such a tolerant culture. Uh, but at the same time, it does have some techniques that are quintessentially Egyptian, such as the famous recipe for the uh, the cakes of light, which uh, we can trace back, and I've traced that back in many sources, to uh, the Egyptian practice of making these... Uh, these cakes of light and, and to other more shamanic practices that existed before then. So that's Crowley and the uh, Book of the Law, which uh, is very appropriate for the time that we uh, I'm speaking. I'm going to release this, uh, this podcast uh, to coincide with the reception of the three chapters of the Book of the Law. And I'll leave you with a little bit of a reading uh, from the text. So thanks for listening uh, and check out. Please do subscribe to the, the podcast and the other episode and check them out uh, as that helps us keep going. Goodbye and Seneb tea. Hard. The manifestation of Newit. The unveiling of the company of heaven. Every man and every woman is a star. Every number is infinite. There is no difference. Help me, O warrior lord of Thebes, in my unveiling before the children of men. Be thou had it, my secret center, my heart and my tongue. Behold, it is revealed by Iwas, the minister of Harpocrat, the cabs is in the coo, not the coo in the cabs. Worship then the cabs, and behold my light shed over you. Let my servants be few and secret, they shall rule the many and the known. These are fools that men adore, both their gods and their men are fools. O oh, come forth, O oh children, under the stars, and take your fill of love. I am above you and in you, my ecstasy is in yours, my joy is to see your joy. Above the gemmed azure is the naked splendor of Nuit, she spends in ecstasy to kiss the secret ardors of Hadit. The winged globe, the starry blue, are mine, O Ank Afna Konsu. Now you shall know that the chosen priest and apostle of infinite space is the prince, priest, the beast, and in his woman called the Scarlet Woman is all power given, and they shall gather my children into their fold. They shall bring the glory of the stars into the hearts of men.
But to him is the winged secret flame, and to her the stooping starlight. But ye are not so chosen. Burn upon their brows, O splendorous serpent, O azure-lidded woman, bend upon them. The key of the rituals is in the secret word which I have given unto him. With the god and the adorer I am nothing, they do not see me. They are as, as upon the earth. I am heaven, and there is no other god than me, and my lord had it. Now, therefore, I am known to you by my name, Newt, and to him by a secret name which I will give him when at last he knows me. Since I am infinite space and the infinite stars thereof, do ye also thus find nothing, that there be no difference made amongst you between any one thing and any other thing, for thereby cometh hurt. But whoso avail us in this, let him be the chief of all. I am Newt, and my number is six and fifty. Divide, add, multiply, and understand. Then saith the prophet and the slave of the beauteous one, Who am I? And what shall be the sign? So she answered him, bending down the lambent flame of blue, all touching, all penetrant, her lovely hands upon the black earth, and her lithe body arched for love, and her soft feet not hurt in the little flowers thou knowest. And the sign shall be my ecstasy, and the consciousness of the continuity of existence, the omnipresence of my body. Then the priest answered and said unto the queen of space, kissing her lovely brows, and the dew of a light bathing his whole body in the sweet-smelling perfume of sweat, O knew it, continuous one of heaven, let it be ever thus, that men speak not of thee as one, but as none, and let them speak not of thee at all, since thou art continuous. None, breathe delight, faint and fairy of the stars, and two. For I am divided for love's sake, for the chance of union. This is the creation of the world, that the pain of division is as nothing, and the joy of dissolution all. For these fools of men and their woes care not thou at all, they feel little. What is, is balanced by weak joys, but ye are my chosen ones. Obey my prophet, follow out the ordeals of my knowledge, seek me only, then the joys of my love will redeem ye from all pain. This is so, I swear it by the vault of my body, by my sacred heart and tongue, by all I can give, by all I desire of ye all. Then the priest fell into a deep trance or swoon, and said unto the Queen of Heaven, Write unto us the ordeals, write unto us the rituals, write unto us the laws. But she said, The ordeals I write not, the rituals shall be half known and half concealed. The law is for all. This that thou writest is the threefold book of law. My scribe, Ank Afna Konsu, the priest of the princes, shall not in one letter change this book, but lest there be folly he shall comment upon by the wisdom of Rahor Quit. Also the mantras and spells, the obia and the wanga, the work of the wand and the work of the sword, these he shall learn and teach. He must teach, but he may make severe the ordeals. The word of the law is Salema. Who calls us Salamites will do no wrong, if he look but close into the word. For there are therein three grades, the hermit, the lover, and the man of earth. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. The word of sin is restriction. O man, refuse not thy wife. If she will, O lover, if thou wilt, depart. 
There is no bond that can unite the divided but love. All else is a curse. Accursed, accursed be it to the eons. Hell. Let it be that the state of manyhood bound and loathing. So with thy all, thou hast no right but to do thy will. Do that, and no other shall say nay. For pure will, unassuaged the purpose, delivered from lust of result, is in every way perfect. The perfect and the perfect are one perfect and not two, nay, are none. Nothing is the secret key of this law. Sixty-one, the Jews call it, I call it eight, eighty, four hundred and eighteen. But they have the half united by nine art, so that all disappear. My prophet is a fool with his one, one, one. They are not they, the ox, and none by the book. Abrogate all rituals, all ordeals, all words and signs. Raho quit, have taken his seat in the east at the equinox of the gods. And let Usa be with Isa, who also are one. But they are not of me. Let Usa be the adorant, and Isa the sufferer, and Hor in his secret name and splendor is the Lord of initiating. There is a word to say about the hierophantic task. Behold, there are three ordeals in one, and it may be given in three ways. The gross must pass through the fire, let the fine be tried in intellect, and the lofty chosen ones in the highest. Thus she have star and star, system and system, let none one know well the other. Let not one know well the other. There are four gates to one palace, and the floor of that palace is of silver and gold. Lapis lazuli and jasper are there, and all rare scents, jasmine and rose, and the emblems of death. Let him enter in turn, or at once, the four gates. Let him stand on the floor of the palace. Will he not sink? Om, ho, oh, warrior, if thy servants sink, but in there are means and means. Be goodly, therefore. Dress you all in fine apparel. Eat rich foods and drink sweet wines and wines that foam. Also take your fill and will of love as you will, when, where, and with whom you will, but always unto me. If this is not a right, if ye confound the space marks, saying they are one, or saying they are many, if the ritual is not ever unto me, then expect direful judgments of Rahor quit. Thus shall regenerate the world, the little world, my sister, my heart and my tongue, unto whom I send this kiss. O oh, also scribe and prophet, Though thou be of the princes, it shall not assuage thee or absolve thee. But ecstasy is mine, and joy of earth ever to me, to me. Change not as much as a style of a letter. For behold, thou, O prophet, shall not behold all these mysteries hidden therein. The child of thy bowels, he shall behold them. Expect him not from the east nor from the west, for from no expected house cometh that child. Om, all words are sacred and all prophets true, save only that they understand a little. Solve the first half of the equation, leave the second unattacked, but thou hast all in the clear light and some no, not all in the dark. Invoke me under the stars. Love is the law, love under will. Nor let the fools mistake love, for there is love and love. There is the dove and there is the serpent. Che choose ye well. He, my prophet, has chosen, knowing the law of the fortress and the great mystery of the house of God. All these letters of my book are aright, but Zadi is new at the star. 
This also is secret, my prophet shall reveal it to the wise. I give unimaginable joys on earth, certainty not faith, while in life, upon death, peace unutterable, rest, ecstasy, nor do I demand aught in sacrifice. My incense is of resinous woods and gums, and there is no blood therein, because of my hair, the trees of eternity. My number is eleven, as all their numbers who are of us, the five-pointed star with the circle in the middle, and the circle is red. My color is black to the blind, but the blue and gold are seen of the seeing. Also, I have a secret glory for them that love me, but to love me is better than all things. If under the night stars in the desert thou presently burnest my incense before me, invoking me with a pure heart and the serpent flame therein, thou shalt come a little to lie in my bosom. For one kiss wilt thou then be willing to give all, but whoso gives one particle of dust shall lose all in that hour. Ye shall gather goods and store of women and spices. Ye shall wear rich jewels. You shall exceed the nations of the earth in splendor and pride, but always in the love of me. And so shall you come to my joy. I charge you earnestly to come before me in a single robe and covered with a rich headdress. I love you. I yearn to you pale or purple, veiled or voluptuous, I who am all pleasure and purple and drunkenness of the innermost sense desire you. Put on the wings and arouse the cold splendor within you. Come unto me. At all my meetings with you shall the priestess say, and her eyes shall burn with desire as she stands bare and rejoicing in my secret temple to me, to me, calling forth the flame of the hearts of all in her love chant. Sing the rapturous love song unto me, burn to me perfumes, wear to me jewels, drink to me, for I love you, I love you. I am the blue-lidded daughter of sunset, I am the naked brilliance of the voluptuous night sky. To me, to me, the manifestation of Newit is at an end.